Hello there. Hi. So uh, yeah, my name is Ken Weston, um, and I'm, today I'm going to be talking about um, the insider threat kill chain, detecting human indicators of compromise. Um, so real quick, just a little bit about me. Um, you know, one thing when I was researching in insider threat is that I learned I am the insider threat um, in a lot of ways. Actually, when you profile someone who could be an insider, um, it, it, all the fingers pointed to me. Uh, so it was kind of interesting. Um, I actually developed a website called usbhacks.com that focused on USB-based exploits um, back in the day of uh, good old Microsoft auto run um, and some other interesting things uh, at the time around the weaknesses around USB. Had a lot of tools that were available and talked about and discussed. Um, that actually turned into a, a, a product called Gadget Track, which was theft recovery software. Um, started with USB devices. Um, I couldn't quit there. Moved into laptops and uh, mobile phones. Um, basically gather information to track down um, where the device is, take photos of the person, um, and uh, ended up putting a lot of people in jail. Um, learned quite a bit about that, not just about recovering stolen devices, but also um, some of the research around that goes around it using open source data, um, you know, um, having to go out and build some tools to go scan for additional information. Um, through that, I also developed a, a product called Camera Trace. It's uh, basically a distributed EXIF scanner search engine. It goes out and indexes websites. You do a search for serial numbers, and then uh, <clears throat> it'll uh, show you any photos that were taken with that particular camera. Um, so I'm currently a Tripwire security analyst uh, in product marketing. I focus on log intelligence and uh, forensics, and there's some of my information here. So your organization's greatest asset is also its greatest risk, and I think that's really where um, the insider threat um, issue um, is really problematic. It's the very people that are within the organization. Um, so a little experience here. I was working for a company, um, and uh, we'd hired an administrator to uh, help out with some hardening some servers. Um, come to find out, there was a disagreement with management about his uh, um, his billing. Uh, he was overcharging us, and uh, they caught it. Um, they confronted him with it. And um, thing is, he the, the management and HR they didn't tell um, anyone else in IT. Um, and I was um, in charge of the website at the time. And at three in the morning one day, I started getting these alerts that the website was down. Um, I log into the server and I come to find out, you know, uh, just doing some anal quick analysis and looking at log files and some of the file changes, um, that he actually purposely logged into the server, um, shut the server down, modified a bunch of the HTTP uh, config files for Apache, um, and made it so that even if you reboot the server, it wouldn't come back up. I was able to fix it pretty quickly, um, but. Uh, it was really interesting is once I was able to get the information, I actually started seeing some of the emails that were exchanged with him. It, it mapped the, to the timeline uh, perfectly. And if uh, management could have told us that there was this issue, that there was a potential risk, then um, we could have mitigated this by either you know, re removing his access or at least reducing his privileges. So you guys may have heard about the uh, another uh, case, uh, network admin who was on a, um, he's actually on a uh, aircraft carrier. Uh, he got busted for hacking. And uh, he, um, there was a whole list of website or uh, servers that he had gotten into. Um, and it's, it's really interesting is that, you know, on a nuclear submarine, you'd think that they would have, you know, pretty good protocols and security policies in place to, to mitigate things like this. Um, but apparently they didn't. Uh, you know, he was able to download all these different tools. I mean, even something as simple as Nmap should fire off alerts within your organization. If you start seeing some um, anomalous traffic and scans, you know, that should be an alert as well. Um, and this guy was able to do this for years before he actually got caught. And he wasn't even caught on the boat itself. It was actually when he tried to hack into another uh, Navy server um, that they were able to catch him. So it's not just you know in military, but also um, uh, in, in financial services. Um, this is a, an administrator. Um, he was actually hired by Fannie Mae. Um, he got fired because he made a configuration error in, uh, um, change in error that uh, caused damage to some systems. The HR department decided to let him go back to his desk and finish the rest of the day after they fired him. Um, he had admin access to the company's 4,000 servers. Uh, he wrote a logic bomb to disable logins and wipe logs on a specific date and time. Um, luckily, after he left, another engineer had found that code before it could actually execute. Um, the guy was sentenced to 41 months in prison. Um, what's really scary, though, is that after he, he was working there, uh, before he actually went to jail, he'd worked for um, Bank of America, Amtrak, NGE, all the senior system administrator with highly privileged access. 
So when I look at uh, the insider threat, I like to look at um, you know their intentions. If you look at any sort of uh, risk analysis, they always measure threat as a product of capability and intent. Um, and CERT, uh, they have an insider threat division, and they actually looked at real cases, and they found um, that you know, motivation is you know 37% of its fraud, and that's usually someone trying to um, you know get um, financial gain, right? They're not there to cause damage to the systems; they just want more money. And those types of uh, insiders are going to be be entrenched for a long period of time, and usually their fraud is it's going to be something that happens over a course of months or years. Um, then you had IT sabotage, and that's usually going to be a short time or someone who's planning on leaving, uh, maybe someone that got passed over for a promotion. Um, and then you have you know intellectual property theft. Um, that can be someone who's on the inside. Um, you know sometimes developers, right? They feel like they uh, co-own source code. So before they leave an organization, um, they may help themselves to a code repository. Um, same thing with sales. They may log into their Salesforce account or other systems and um, download a, a great deal of information. And then of course you have espionage which can be corporate or it can also be um, uh, you know state sponsored but it's really interesting though is if you start looking at this um, you know depending on what their their intent is um, they're going to have different indicators and you need to deal with them differently so the, uh, the insider threat kill chain, I mean, we're all familiar, familiar with kill chains, but that doesn't really work well for an insider threat because we're dealing with someone who's not necessarily a hacker trying to get in from outside. What we're dealing with is someone who has authorized, authorized credentials to do unauthorized things. Um, so we have to take this from a different approach. And um, uh, CISO at the FBI actually uh, did a presentation. He talked about um, what he called the insider threat kill chain. I, I like this model a lot better. Um, it starts with basically the recruitment or tipping point. So this can be where someone on the outside has paid someone or maybe given them a job offer, um, you know, or they've met, accepted a job offer and it would be helpful for them to have some additional information from a competitor. Um, or it's the tipping point. It's where they get frustrated. They're pissed off. They got passed over for that promotion. Um, they're complaining to everyone around them about how they don't get paid enough. Um, they hate their manager, right? Um, so then the next phase is the search and recon phase where, you know, they're actually looking for what information can they grab. Um, if they're a privileged insider or a tech savvy insider, this might also be a point where they're trying to run vulnerability scans inside the network, which is quite common. Um, even running something as simple as Nmap just to get a map of the network. Um, then they'll actually start doing the acquisition and collection of information. Uh, then, of course, we'll have the exfiltration or the actual action where they actually try to cause damage. And sort of through these different phases, there's um, you know different things we can do to defend, defend ourselves. So usually when it comes to uh, the prevention side, uh, the, it's not real technical. There's not a whole lot that you can do. Um, it's the same thing as if you're dealing with an adversary who's doing uh, recon on, on your company, right? Um, you can't really detect that until they actually touch the network in some fashion. So this is usually something where you're going to have um, HR policies. Um, you're going to you know, uh, make sure that there's clear lines of communication with HR and IT. Um, if there is going to be a rift, if there's going to be layoffs, um, if there is a, a group of employees um, that that they, they think is at risk, behavioral problems. Um, all this type of information should be shared. And you would be surprised how few HR and IT departments actually communicate with each other. Um, and it's really interesting as if just uh, just a, a, even casual conversations or weekly, or, I mean, sorry, monthly meetings, um, it can actually do quite a bit to at least understand how things work um, and how they can uh, go in and actually flag some of these high-risk employees. Then, of course, we'll have technical indica indicators, which I'll get to a, a little bit as well. So all along the way, usually there's an indicator when they're trying to access servers or um, that they don't have access to, trying to escalate their privileges. Um, there's going to be um, information that will appear in logs. So um, some things we can look at for on the prevention side for human indicators of compromise. So these are things that like your HR department are going to watch for. Um, someone who's consistently first in and last out of the office, um, that's usually showing a sign of um, wanting, wanting to be in control. They don't want other people to view their work. Um, you know, uh, 12 months of unused vacation, um, life change, it can be a marital status change. If they give notice, there's a layoff, uh, pass over for promotion, or disciplinary action. So not all, not all these are going to say that, yeah, this person isn't inside their threat, but these are things that can show increased risk. And also on the vacation side, it's not necessarily that that person, like, you know, it could be that they don't want to take vacation because they don't want someone else to review their work. Um, but it can also be that someone else is using their credentials on the inside. 
So uh, some things that uh, like HR and legal can do is you know, consider threats from insiders and, and partners in risk assessments. Um, you know, I think we have a tendency to think about penetration testing as you know the malicious hacker from outside again. But if we start actually considering the insider in our risk assessments and how we model our, um, our networks, um, then it can actually make a huge impact to reduce risk. Um, make sure you do background checks. Um, CERT did another study and they found that a lot of folks that were actually doing insider type crimes actually had records. Um, and simply running background checks on some of those folks, they're going to have privileged access, uh, might be a good idea depending on where you work. You want to clearly document and enforce policies and controls. Um, you know, they, that's important at least, especially if you have monitoring in place, you'd be amazed at the impact that it can have on your organization if people think they're being watched, even if you're, they're not. Um, you want to have a periodic security awareness training for all your employees. Uh, monitor and respond to suspicious or disruptive behavior, again, more on the HR side. Um, anticipate and manage negative workplace issues. So, um, you know, if there is financial issues in the company or there's going to be a rift, again, that's something that you need to uh, keep uh, into consideration. Uh, track and secure your physical environment. Um, you know, you can have the best IT security in the world, but uh, if you don't lock your server room, yeah, bad stuff. We'll, I'll talk about an actual case that uh, happened at Los Alamos around that. Um, you know, establish clear lines of communication and procedures between HR, legal, and IT, kind of what we've been talking about. So then there's um, sort of uh, actual technical indicators. So these are things that we can actually track on the technology side. If we're seeing that there's an increased number of logins, you know, variation of remote and local, um, something might be up. If uh, they're logging in the network at odd times, again, uh, late at night, um, that might be another indicator. Um, it was CERT did a study too where they found the majority of the attacks they saw were remote logins via VPN and then exfiltrating data out over SSH or RDP uh, to a remote server. And then we'll talk a little bit how you can actually detect that in a you know basic sim. Uh, see, logging in frequently during vacation times, again, may not be an indicator that this person um, is the attacker. It might be someone um, with one of their, uh, their business partners. Uh, remote logging um, using uh, by different employee credentials. So if you see that, you know, on one system that's usually, you know, it's owned by one particular person and then other credentials are uh, used on that device, um, that's, that's a big red flag right there. Um, changes in websites that are visited, uh, work versus personal. Uh, you know, someone who's hitting Facebook and LinkedIn and, and Glassdoor a little bit more than usual. Um, that might be something you want to keep an eye on. Um, increased printer usage as well. Um, there, there's, uh, be amazed how many people don't actually log um, what gets printed. Um, that's actually a really good indicator that uh, some information might be leaving your, um, your environment. You know, um, look for any sort of export of large reports, downloads from internal systems. So um, you should be monitoring if you know someone's going into Salesforce, downloading large uh, reports, uh, large chunks of data. Um, these are things you're going to you want to monitor. I'm trying to keep it on time here. Uh, so yeah, then policy and technology. Uh, you want to implement strict uh, password and account policies and force separation of duties and, and least privilege. You know, I think a lot of this stuff it's it's pretty common knowledge um, in IT security. Um, but you'd be surprised how many of this sometimes gets overlooked. So, you know, the thing is, we have all this data that's available to us, and, you know, it tells us a lot of information about what's going on inside the network. Um, but it's really difficult to make sense of it unless we actually look at it as a whole. So, you know, monitoring an employee, what, what devices are accessing, what information they have access to, um, this is all critical for us to, to be able to establish um, if we actually do have an insider threat. And you know the first thing you want to do is be able to act on that information in real time. So if um, an employee tries to access a server that they're um, not authorized to view, um, that's something you want to trigger, trigger an alert right away. Um, that needs to be passed off to the SOC or it needs to be um, emailed to an admin depending on the size of your organization. So that's stuff that you want to be able to do in real time. And you can do that through your typical SIM, open source SIMs. Um, there's some um, logging tools that are out there. Um, I think most people have some sort of a SIM or some sort of a log intelligence tool in their environment that they can take advantage of. Um, Splunk is another good one that can, can do some of this. Um, and from that, you can do your alerts. You can do mobile notifications. Um, you can even activate scripts. You can go in and actually deactivate someone's account, for example. Um, then you want to be able to have the analytics and forensics and storage capability. So that's really important to be able to go back and actually you detect something happened. You want to go back and look at that person's behavior. What else did they do? What other files did they touch? Was this the only information they've stolen or is this something they've been doing for a long period of time? And you're going to need to have that information, not just to go back and identify, you know, where you need to remediate, but also for law enforcement. And if there's an HR issue, then you're going to get um, legal involved as well. And you need to make sure you have that information and that it's valid. 
So when uh, people ask what to log first, um, you know, I always say firewalls, um, your unsuccessful login attempts, um, IDS. Um, uh, IDS should be deployed not just on the outside and the perimeter, but also inside. Um, actually, I've got an example of where I um, actually have, you know, NMAP can be detected if someone's running an internal scan. Um, you know, if, you know, uh, Joe in accounting is joining NMAP scans, that might be a little questionable. Um, and you want to look at web proxies, antivirus alerts, and then any sort of uh, anything around change management, any configuration changes. Um, you want to determine your log volume to start out with. I'm going to skip over this because I uh, want to get to some of the good stuff. So there's correlation rules that you can set up. So this is uh, pretty much any sim will allow you to do this. It's going to be in different formats. But um, you know, log on attempts from terminated employees or contractors, odd remote log on patterns from employees, um, you know, any sort of anomalous behavior with, um, that deals with log ons and authentication from your employees or trusted business partners. Um, if an employee disables antivirus, that gets logged. That's something you can watch for. An employee visits a blocked websites frequently. Um, if he's uh, uh, downloads a large file from the internet or CRM, and you can usually detect that. Good. Um, so if employee installs and uses Tor in a company system, um, or if they're installing any sort of scanning or hacking tools. Uh, yeah, so let's log a, a real problem here. So if an employee behavior he shows potential risk to the business, I want to monitor to see if he connects to servers outside the network. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to set up rules um, and alert on con connections to outgoing ports after hours on port 22, 23, and 3389. So this is was CERT, when they did their research, they actually found that this was a common um, attack pattern. Um, so this is really easy to implement. This is in uh, CEE. It's an open source format um, that you can actually import into most sims. Um, at Tripwire Log Center, we, we support it, or it, you can import this into ArcSight as well. And some of them have their own proprietary formats for this, but you know it's all going to be um, you know pretty similar. Um, you can even create uh, dashboards. So integrating your SIM directly with Active Directory will help uh, get a lot of this information for you. So this is my watch list where I'm actually watching terminated employees and logons. Um, I can actually watch for any sort of large file shares that get created. Um, and uh, and uh, let's see what else. Yeah, the, I'm also watching time of day, when the logons are. And all this information can, can be correlated, and it sort of increases their risk score as well. So I had one uh, case study where we had a power company uh, where they actually deployed um, our log intelligence tool. And they discovered uh, that, uh, that there was an account of a terminated system admin in use. He was logging into the network at 4 a.m. on a Wednesday. Um, they also discovered that he had gone in and disabled logging on a key firewall. So uh, we kind of wanted to know why, why would you want to be doing that? Um, there was another one where we had a major tire retailer. Um, they actually deployed both um, a log intelligence tool and uh, file integrity monitoring. Um, and they discovered that there was a backdoor account that was created by a terminated employee. So um, it wasn't just his account, but he had created several other accounts. So this is where you want to go backtrack and see where did this person, what other activities has this person done, what other accounts has he created, and what have they done. So here's a you know example of well, like what can it get picked up by an IDS internally? Um, you know you see this can be someone on the inside, maybe it's a hacker that got inside, or it can be an insider actually running those scans. So it's good to have an IDS set up on the inside. Um, I also highly re recommend um, a honeypot. Um, it gets a little more technical, a little more legal gray area, um, but there's a lot of things that you can do there. Um, you want to, for a response, you want to implement secure backup recovery processes, quickly audit users' network behavior, um, if, and develop an insider instant response plan. And again, this needs to be interdepartmental. Um, if IT is working alone on trying to, to detect the insider, um, there's going to be a lot of problems. So quick here. So this was uh, USB hacks. I started that a, a while back. I um, actually used uh, Trojan, USB-based Trojans to recover stolen devices. Um, it was a lot of fun. Um, that technology was actually deployed to FLIR thermal imaging cameras. They actually uh, did it for theft recovery and for um, uh, export controls. Um, but it's interesting is that there was a case in Los Alamos in 2006. A, an 18-year-old uh, was hired and given security clearance to work at Los Alamos Labs in a vault archiving data. Um, there was a meth lab that got busted, and they found three flash drives that were uh, that she had brought. She brought work home. That's what it was for. Her boyfriend's the one that got busted for the meth lab. So, the data went from one lab to another. Um, what's interesting is how easy it was. She was able to just go in the, there. She brought flash drives in, plugged it in. No one watched her. No one searched her. Um, and this was in a highly secure area. And it was she had access to it was information on the um, on a nuclear tests that were done in the 70s. So um, they had no, they had a policy about no flash drives, but it was never enforced. 
So you can also um, log uh, physical security, so key fob systems. That's another great uh, tool. Uh, a lot of people don't think about that, but um, a lot of those devices generate um, logs. So one flash drive that I actually helped recover, um, we actually tracked it down to a, a university in North Texas, uh, one particular computer lab. Um, that lab also had required a student ID to be swiped, so there was log data there. We also found that the, they had been uh, robbed several times with some computers that were taken, and there was logs of a lot of the uh, closed caption cameras log time as well. So we were able to correlate all this information, all this log data, and we had more than enough information for the police to be involved in, and get that device back um, and easily identify who took it. Um, you know, lazy logging. If you want to, uh, you know, log um, your uh, USB flash drives, you can actually. F there's a technique to watch outbound uh, proxy logs or your IPS. Anytime on Windows systems when you connect a flash drive, uh, it actually sends information out to these two URLs, um, so you can monitor that. Um, and there's a, a link down here. I'll put my slides up, um, but um, they'll kind of explain how to go about doing that. And about 80% of the time, it's going to work. But it's something you can do quick and dirty just to detect flash drives that are being plugged into your environment. Um, some future threats, you know, I'm, I've been thinking a lot about um, other uh, things that people can do, um, be it uh, Zigbee radios or, you know, rogue mesh networks that get put into an, an area. You're talking about highly technical, um, savvy folks. Um, so I'm working with my friend uh, Jared, uh, he's helping with the HackRF project, you know, seeing how we can actually sniff out some of these rogue, um, uh, these rogue networks. Um, if there's a, a Zigbee radio that's in there that shouldn't be, um, being able to at least detect that. Um, and then take it a step further and actually get three devices and try to identify the location of the device. So, sorry I had to go really fast, but I only had a few minutes left. <laughs> Great. I got five minutes, so if you guys have questions.